Welcome to today's episode of Freshly Grounded. And if you're a fan of the kind of content that we create, we will be super grateful if you considered joining us and supporting us on Patreon. By being a member of our Patreon community for just five pounds per month, you'll get access to an early release of episodes, extra content, and a few other bits and bobs. But most importantly, you support Freshly Grounded. Sign up at patreon.com forward slash Freshly Grounded and I hope you enjoy this episode. Sorry for blabbing. I apologize. Enjoy. And welcome to a Freshly Grounded, the brand new podcast. Well, it's not exactly brand new anymore, is it? Welcome to Freshly Grounded, the podcast. That's better. Created by best friends, Faisal and Sam. Huh? I, welcome, I said, welcome to Freshly Grounded. After that bit. Created by... And after that bit. Best friends, Faisal and Sam. Really? Okay, and we're on. Abdullah, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. You said you don't get nervous. Uh, uh. That's not, that can't be true. You must get nervous in something. Nobody never gets nervous. Why are uh, you nervous? I wouldn't say entirely, um, but alhamdulillah, it's a lot less than what I see others. Fine. How, how nervous others get. But, uh, but what would make you nervous? Hmm. It's a good question. Uh, there has to be Driving. Something. Really? Driving makes me nervous. Do you do you, do you drive? Uh, so I'm taking lessons at the moment. Fine. Uh, so that's actually. that's normal then, because then eventually that will that will not make you nervous once you get used hopefully, to it. Hopefully, hopefully, inshallah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I wonder if there's anything. Well, how do you behave when you're nervous? Uh, start sweating. Okay. Ha- hands get uh, palms get a bit sweaty and everything, but uh, might go a bit red. Well, yeah. <laughs> I um when it. I'm nervous. Yeah. Uh, I, I wear my heart on my sleeve So you okay. can see any emotion I'm yeah, ever going through And um, when I'm nervous I have this uncontrollable thing With my lips like Shake Oh qu- <sighs> quaver, quavering lips I think Yeah cool. Yeah okay It's the yeah. worst And I look like I'm about to cry Right But I'm not it's like the feeling just before Yeah okay. it's, I'm not gonna cry I don't feel like crying But it looks like I'm gonna Yeah Yeah it's very yeah. difficult But uh, easy, Inshallah Yeah Um so look, let, 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 let's introduce you to the audience. So um, thank you for, for first of all for getting in touch and then for also coming down because I know you came from far and we've actually met before at the at the yes. as soon as I saw you I thought we yeah. definitely met before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you uh, were working as uh, at the uh, event. The yeah, I was one of the there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How did you find that event? Yeah, alhamdulillah. Uh, it feels like a life. It was just before lockdown. It yeah. Feels it truly feels like a lifetime ago now. Was it just um, before lockdown? It was January two thousand twenty. So really, a couple of months before lockdown. Mm. I'd say yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I remember I'm going to that event with my with my family, um, my parents, my sisters, and uh, everyone kind of really enjoyed it. Uh, and I volunteered. A few friends from from my ISOC, uh, Islamic Society at University, we, we we volunteered there and everything. And uh, alhamdulillah, it went really well, really well. And um, yeah, it I does feel like a lifetime ago, January 2020. I was thinking because we missed like the next couple of tours after that. Yeah, there would have been a there tour was in a the live summer. event. I think in, in April you had or April or May. Uh, there was a oh a fresh fresh event. Like, yeah. event. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. yes. That yeah. I was I was looking to get the day off so I could go to Birmingham. For oh it. wow! Um, but then yeah, everything just shut down suddenly. Had you been to any of other live events? No. So you the, have the previous to. ones were in London, and I, and I I remember watching the live stream for the first one, episode one hundred. Okay. Um, where Muslim Bilal was there. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Sam was there. There were yeah. a few people, and I, I was watching the live event, and I was like, wow, I wish I was there. Oh <laughs> just, man, yeah. Was, make sure you come crazy. to the next one, inshallah. Yeah, inshallah. Bug me before when you announce it. Bug me, and I'll make sure inshallah. I get to across inshallah. you. Guys. Inshallah, inshallah. So um. Let's talk about your journey because you got you got in touch because um, yeah. I think uh, you must have seen the uh, episode with Ismail yes. we want right yes yes, yes. and um, yeah when I read your email it was striking because you don't often come you don't come across yeah with that kind of story every day yeah, yeah and um, yeah. it's very generous of you for wanting to share your mm-hmm. story and be open to be vulnerable about it because it brings up all these emotions yeah and it's really tough to talk about it's, and then it's, yeah. i cry <laughs> and then but the good thing is i have this handy little switcher here <laughs> so normally when um uh, we had a few emotional episodes i can mm-hmm. like switch over and so people don't see so i'm hoping not to cry today uh, but, um, well alhamdulillah I, I i've told my story a few times before and alhamdulillah it's been very um i i've been i'm i'm quite able to fine. sort of alhamdulillah keep my composure when, when telling it the story but um well, but I suppose yeah. it, I suppose sure. it, you could also look at it from an uplifting perspective. Yep, absolutely. Right, like it's absolutely. like uh, it, I suppose how you how you look at things and, yeah. and where you are now. So, um, yeah. So you were seventeen. You're twenty one now. Yeah, now I'm twenty one. And you were seventeen uh, years old. Was, yeah, I was seventeen. So it was uh, August two thousand seventeen. Uh, so 
I was 17 at the time, yeah. And it was actually not far from here in South London. I was in Croydon with my grandparents when it happened. When you say it, what was it? Uh, so my illness, in, in, to put it into, uh, into, t into the medical terminology, it was a brain hemorrhage. Okay. Which in simple terms, is, is, uh, it's, I think it, shows, it says that it's similar to, it's, it's, a, it's a severe kind of stroke, I think. Wow. That's, ex uh, that's what it says. So <coughs> what it basically is, Alhamdulillah. 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 Uh, so yeah, you're gonna have to give me this episode. It's gonna be full of that because I got hay fever and I, I suffer from really yeah, yeah, bad yeah. hay fever. So well, I, I I actually had it yesterday. I just took an antihistamine last night. Yeah, I took one so, this morning yeah. as well. You're gonna have to forgive me because it's gonna be like yeah. a constant annoying no worries, thing. No that I'll try and push the mic away, but just continue no on. So, um, fine. So yeah, so uh, so yeah, so it was a brain a brain hemorrhage. Um, my ad actually was out of the blue, completely out of the blue. Okay. So there were no sort of warning signs, you could say, or no. Not, nothing that really indicated that it would happen. And also, to put it into perspective, um, brain hemorrhage, the illness, uh, what normally it occurs, it occurs in over 60s, over 70s. I think it was over 70s, uh, according to the NHS. So it's very, very rare for younger people to fall ill. To put it, uh, to, for an example, actually, is Sir Alex Ferguson. In May 2018, he had a brain hemorrhage. Is that what his latest Prime documentary is about? Yes, and the documentary is about ah, that. Yes, his, his whole experience with it. And to be honest, when I actually watched that exp uh, that whole documentary, and a lot of it, I was able to res res um, I, was, I was able to sort of uh, resonate with. I can imagine because a lot of what he, a lot of the side effects and everything he went through also happened to me at, at some point uh, through my recovery. So yeah, so I was 17. Uh, a, bl a brain hemorrhage basically is when uh, a blood clot. Um, a blood clot forms in the brain, mm -hmm. and uh, one of the vessels, or uh, blood blood vessels, or blood arteries, uh, erupts. Sorry, I'm I'm the worst at medical terminology. No, not to my illness. I I never had an interest in medicine uh, so, or in any, anything medical. So I'm sort of like uh, not too sure, but uh, about the terms and everything. But what I do understand is that um, it's when a brain, a, uh, an artery or or a vessel, a blood vessel in the brain erupts, causing a blood clot. And it's like a bleeding on the brain, essentially on the on the on the brain organ uh, itself. So that pretty much is what a brain hemorrhage is. Yeah. Uh, okay. And you said it came out of the blue. Yeah. So what happens on the outside? What does a person yeah. see? What does a person feel? I so, have no knowledge of yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, again, I I knew literally nothing about this. I I didn't even know this was a such a thing because, as I said, it wasn't. It's not common amongst sure. my age or my generation. I would say, or even my parents' generation. It's more my grandparents older, so yeah. much older yeah so what i remember is i remember i um so i had been the, the, as a normal like a normal day um i was staying with my grandparents so my grandparents actually they live in a, in a house with my uncle and his family in sort of an annex so they have an annex and my uncle and his family has an annex has, has the main house and um they had all gone to east london that day to spend a week with um, their maternal grandparents so it was just me and my grandparents and my family had actually got flown out for Hajj. It was in August, so it was just before Hajj. So they had flown out for Hajj, so it was just me and my grandparents. And I remember that morning we went to uh, Bromley um, by bus and everything. We did a bit of shopping there, had a bit of lunch, fish and chips, you know, classic, and then came back. Um, and as soon as we got back, I remember we, it was close to Maghrib time. So we prayed Maghrib, uh, me and my grandfather. And, uh, and meanwhile, my father, my, well, my parents actually, and my sisters from uh, who were in Saudi, uh, they called um, to sort of you know catch up. Um, so I remember I spoke while my grandfather was praying Sunnah, and then the plan was he uh, when he finished he would take the phone and I would pray Sunnah. So I remember I I just sort of remember all of this vividly. It's not like it's not very very clear in my mind, but vividly I remember that I was uh, I was I was sort of lying down on the sofa. It was it was like a long sofa uh, right next to where we prayed. And I was sort of talking to my father on loudspeaker and uh, we, I was just discussing with him and everything. And suddenly, very suddenly, I started getting a very, very sudden onset of a headache, a very severe headache, especially in the back. So me personally, it's genetic that um, from my grandmother and from my father, um, headaches, sort of migraines, headaches runs, runs in the family. Uh, but I, I thought it was weird, but the headaches we get are normally at the front around the temple area. So when the headache came on and it was at the back, it was my neck almost, I sort of thought that's a bit odd, you know, it's a bit weird. It doesn't normally happen. So I thought, okay, I, I didn't think much of it. I thought maybe it's just a one-off. So, but then I remember um, later, a, a few minutes later, I said to my father, uh, I've got to go. My, head, my head's really hurting now. And I hung up 
And I don't really remember anything after that. What I do remember me saying is uh, saying to my grandmother who came to the room, she she said later on, she told me that she heard me um, uh, grimacing, make, making grimacing noises. And uh, she said she came into the room and she saw me and I'm ho- and I was holding my head quite tightly or my neck mm-hmm. quite tightly and lying down, of course. Um, but again, I don't remember any of this. But then she, and then she said that uh, very suddenly you you started it, it was quite clear you started panicking and uh, you asked me to call an ambulance. Um, and then she said, and I, I don't remember any of this, but then she said about half a minute later while I'm on the dialing the ambulance 999, she says that you suddenly said my vision has gone completely upside down. Everything is upside down for me. And later, later on, I found that the explanation for that was actually because, um, because of, uh, uh, because the, where the, uh, the, the bleed was, uh, it was on the occipital nerve, which is a nerve in the brain, which actually controls your vision. So because the bleed partly affected that, it distorted my vision completely. Uh, so it, it, it was quite a, and, and after that, I don't remember what, what I'm told is that I was taken in the ambulance. Um, they didn't know what was going on. Uh, so they took me to East Surrey hospital, mm-hmm. which is in Red Hill. Um, I underwent a CT scan there and they confirmed, uh, it was a brain hemorrhage. Then they, uh, they put me in a, in a, on a ventilator and intubated me, which is the, where they put the, the I think the, the machine that takes over your breathing. Sure. Completely. Yeah. So through the throat. Um, so I wasn't able to sort of independently breathe anything of that do you remember any of that no okay. none of this at all i don't remember so i was told later on that i i spoke sir, sir alex ferguson also indicated this that he said his family told him you said sort of certain things you were speaking to us and everything but he said i have no recollection of it it's Fine. the same with me so my, my parents tell me so they flew back straight away yeah uh, they flew back day. within about a few hours so this okay. was around uh where i felt it was around 9 p.m uh i uh, then i my so I fell in around 9 p.m. on the on the 19th of August 2017. Then my surgery. So I was uh, St, um, East Surrey. They transferred me to St George's Hospital mm-hmm. in Tooting. Uh, it's the regional um, neuro, neuro, neuro neurological centre. Sorry, it's a lot of medical terms. No, no, it's fine. So, um, so then I was transferred there, and my surgery was I think at 3 a.m. And my parents, I think they boarded the plane from Saudi from Jeddah at around 6 a.m. So they flew back straight away and sure. uh, they didn't end up doing Hajj actually. They had to delay it for really? a year. Really? So Hajj, they couldn't do Hajj because uh, I fell ill, I think it was 12 days before Eid. Okay. So, they, uh, yeah, well, 10 days before Hajj actually. So it, it was never written for them. It, it wasn't, yeah. Alhamdulillah, wow. they managed to do it the, the next year, the following year. I had actually done it the previous year. 2016, I did Hajj, sure. Alhamdulillah, me and my father. Um, and then this, the, the, the 2017, I stayed back and, and they went, um, my, my parents and my sisters. And then, of course, they had to, that was cancelled, so they went in 2018 again, and alhamdulillah, they managed to do it. So yeah, so um, yeah, alhamdulillah, it's a lot. It's a lot. Uh, it's a lot to remember. You know, they they told me that I said certain things in ICU when I was on a ventilator. I spoke to them. I asked when they arrived. You know, what time they arrived because sure. I knew, and I don't remember any of that at all. So let's let's track it back a bit. So it, it was completely no no symptoms yeah. or anything before. You have, yeah. you were young, and. Did the doctors then tell you why you had why why you got it? Yeah. You so, ca- okay. So so um so basically, alhamdulillah, I was as you, as you rightly said, I was alhamdulillah just like a normal, you know, other seventeen year old. Um, I was I, I was part of a semi pro football league. Oh you know, wow. I used to play I, I used to play football quite what a bit. What position? Uh, I was a winger. I'm I a used goalkeeper. To run quite a bit. Oh right. Okay. And I'm five for eight. All oh, right. Okay. So probably not a great, great one. I mean, you got uh, you got a few, few professional. Uh, players yeah. Who Wasn't were, were um, Peter Schmeichel quite t- uh, short? I can't remember to be honest. I can't remember. One of the one of them in that era were quite short. But okay, fine. Yeah. So you were active. Yeah. So I, I, mean, I was. Yeah. Yeah. So I used to play. I used to play football. I used to play cricket quite a bit. Um, yeah. I used to play. I used to play. I used to be quite an a, a sociable person, sure. outgoing. You play a lot of sports and everything, and um, and yeah, that was all brought to a halt by this. So. There was no, as I said, there was no warning signs. There was nothing sort of like, which said, okay, which indicate, no indicators as such. Mm-hmm. So when I did fall ill, um, after, after that, in the, in the whole, the whole rehabilitation, rehabilitation process, I was in hospital for seven weeks. Wow. Uh, wow. In, in St. George's Hospital. So, yeah. So I was in ICU for about two days and then. You uh, started breathing on your own? Uh, that was after about two days. So I was on a ventilator. So they did the surgery. It was four hours. And then after that for about uh it was about 24 hours, I'd say. I was on the ICU. 
and I was on a ventilator that whole time. And so for that 24 hours, how touch and go was it? Was it like... Very. Okay. Very. I, I'm, I'm told. So I'm told that my when my parents arrived... Uh, so actually, let me take it back slightly. So yeah, sure. apparently in the ambulance, when I was going from East Surrey Hospital to St. George's Hospital, yeah. um, my, grandpa- my grandmother tells me that we were on the road and uh, they have something called the Glasgow Breathing Test, which is an indication of where oxygen levels are. And apparently my oxygen levels were significantly lower than a, a normal, like the, the minimum for a normal human being to breathe on their own. To the extent where my grandmother told me the paramedic, two of them, two of the, two of the ladies there, they started panicking and they, I'm not sure, I, I think they're not supposed to say this, but they basically said to my grandmother, I think we're losing him. It was to that extent. So they, they said, I don't think, we, in other words, I don't think we're going to make it to the hospital with him alive. So it was very, very touch and go, uh, including the surgery. Um, you know, I remember the ho- the doctor did tell my grandmother that, you know, there's no guarantees here. It's we'll, we'll do our best and leave the rest to Allah. Basically, he wasn't Muslim, but he basically said we'll see with the rest. Mm-hmm. And um, we know that it's to do with Allah. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, we 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 know that. Yeah, true. But uh, but yeah. So so it was, wow. uh, and then in ICU and everything. My, when my parents landed uh, back in London, uh, my my father says like before the plane even got to a halt while they were still on the motor on the runway he sort of turned his phone back on to get updates is he still there is he still you know how did the surgery go and everything because they took off uh, just as my surgery was starting oh, while I was still in surgery so it was very very what a ho- difficult what a for them difficult very, plane very difficult. ride for yeah. them to be on absolutely I'm told later on actually my, my sister was telling me that on that whole plane ride mm. so from Jeddah to London I think it's about se- six and a half hours roughly and I'm told that uh, my sister tells me that my father actually refused to even drink water. Oh, can he, said, I, can, that's he, so he said, how can I take anything? How can I drink yeah. water, food, anything when my own son can't? You know, it's like the... the uh, and truly, I think after this whole experience, I, I truly like... It, 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 I, see, I see my parents in a new light. Oh man, be, like, that would 10x once you become a parent as well. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. 100%. I, I'm sure, I'm sure it is. You, I remember you mentioned about um, uh, Zakaria and uh, yeah. you mentioned that event actually. And uh, yeah, it's just it, it, that that was one episode where really my my, my respect, and my admiration for my parents had just gone. Oh man, up by levels I think compared to how it was before. So um, okay, so and I just I want to get a better understanding of what a brain hemorrhage is. Essentially, a person generally like over seventy. Yeah, you just one of your nerves. It starts bleeding. So, uh, so it's the blood vessel. The blood vessel. The blood vessel. Where I'm going to sound so <laughs> dumb for you. Nerves start bleeding. Um, yeah. So one of the blood vessels yeah. pops. Uh, essentially, yeah. So so the 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 lining or the or the yeah the lining of the, of the vessel um, is considered a bit weak, or it can get a bit weak, or there's pressure of blood, or it could be that something's blocking it, blocking the artery where or the vein, where um, there's like a build up of blood. So can it, it in any way be linked to stress? Because you hear these things, don't you, often? It can, but mine... So I'll, I'll get to it in a, a few minutes, but so mine actually, uh, until now, they actually don't know the cause for it. Fine. Uh, they never figured out. They did, uh, I think it was 10 scans, actually. 10 scans? 10 scans in to- throughout my whole re- recovery process. Okay. And they never ever figured out what it was, what caused it. Uh, because there's two main causes. It can either be an... an uh, forgive me, I can't remember which one is which, but one is an AVM and one is an... Uh, an ant- antrivescular malfunction, I think it's called. That's okay. what it stands for. And one can be where it was from birth. So one, an AVM is where from birth you've had a weak vessel. Mm-hmm. The vessel is uh, sorry. The first one is when when um, some uh, uh, like some uh, stress or something uh, hitting the head, for example, or the head hitting something uh, causes the vessel to become weaker. The vessel lining to become weaker, or it could be from birth where um, the vessel that it was just that's how it was that's how it was from the beginning and over years just eroded and and you know it's it's sort of wear that worn out and uh, and yeah so those are the two main causes H- how do they fix that uh so the way they could that's a good question actually i think if they figure out before but of course they they wouldn't in my case because at the age i was at and everything sure yeah they, so i mean in your in your yeah. case once it's all once it's happened how yeah. what what did that what was that surgery uh, they essentially took out the clots, okay. and what they believe they did because they couldn't find any conclusive evidence for uh, evidence for the uh, the actual cause, they believe they probably took out the vein, the erupted vein with it, 
because the vein they can normally do um they can they can normally uh try and figure out what the cause was they can do some tests on it and everything to figure out what what caused it but in my case they just sort of they never knew so they think when they took the clot out which the which was the surgery so the surgery essentially what they did is it was actually on the on the edge of the brain and they they cut through the back of the head here uh, do, do, back do of the you neck, have a actually. scar very not not very visible it's okay. it's sort of worn out and it's covered by uh, my hair mainly uh, so they cut through there and then there's muscles at the back of the neck also the ones which enable us to look up and down right and left they had to cut through that too so i remember for about two months roughly i couldn't look up i was like that the whole time pretty much looking down the whole time uh, so they had to cut through that and to get the blood clot and then they took it out with quite long because it was through all the muscles and everything they had to extract it with I don't know what they call it but basically the equivalent of tweezers medical medical sure. tweezers yeah so um, and then of course when they take it out then there's like it, it sort of bypasses and just reconstructs another way to go around because the blood of course flows through constantly so it'll just it'll just figure out another way to go around and sometimes I think they, there's, there's, there's something where they do a bypass, bypass operation for uh -huh, the heart uh -huh. sometimes they do that where they'll put in another vessel or, or you know an ad hoc one wow man yeah it's a lot of terminology yeah. well, it's a lot to go through as a 17 year old boy absolutely, absolutely. especially when it's unexpected it doesn't yeah. make it any easier when somebody is had an illness from birth but yeah. it, when it hits you by surprise you start wondering mm -hmm. what the cause could be of course on a spiritual level yeah. there's like a plethora of like uh, lessons we could take from yeah. it uh, and I'm sure you have yeah. um, but but it still it still will be just shocking to go through so um what happened after that? So you know you're you, you're in the hospital. Once you were able to leave the hospital, um, what was life like, and mm -hmm. what changed? Yeah. Um, do you have to keep on top of your health now more now as opposed to before, or um, where you where are you at psychologically yeah. now? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so so basically, um, to, to go back to the first part. So in hospital itself, I was in, in induced coma for about three weeks, roughly, or two, I say two weeks, and I think it was four days, okay. exactly. Uh, so I was in induced, in, in, in an induced coma for that duration. And then after that, um, I sort of gradually woke up. So I was, I was sort of drifting between, between consciousness and uh, unconsciousness, sort of like for about, I say a week, in a, or maybe two weeks. Then after that, I was awake, but but I was much more fatigued than before. So that's one of the after effects is fatigue, um, where I get tired quicker than anyone else, pretty much. So alhamdulillah, now it's much, much, much better, alhamdulillah. Uh, but before, I remember like if I did very, very simple things like just maybe walking for about 10 minutes, I'd just be really, really tired by, by the end of it. Um, it's also worth noting, actually, so when I, um, when I the, the, the actual bleed itself, the hemorrhage, was actually... Uh, as I mentioned previously, the occipital nerve, which controls the uh, the the the, sight, the the vision, sorry, that was not the source. Of, that was the, not the place where the bleed happened. That the bleed affected it. It sort of bled onto it. Uh, but the actual uh, point was the uh, cerebellum. Now the cerebellum controls a lot of things, including the balance, including speech, including um, uh. It, yeah, including digestive digestion, digestive system. Really? Wow. Yeah. So all of those things were pretty much knocked out completely. So uh, balance was number one. I could not walk um, at all independently. I, I, I completely lost my balance. Um, I sort of like literally could not do anything independently. So even I had to be initially at least I was on. Um, uh, I had to be accompanied when they when they took, of course, the. Um, the tubes and everything out um, and when I started using the toilet someone had to accompany me to the toilet to the toilet seat and then someone had to help me out, up from the seat to the sink it, w it was very very it, I wasn't independent at all I'd say mm -hmm. so it was very different to how I was accustomed to um, and then also uh, also in terms of digestion um, it I, I, anything I would eat um, but any slight movement would cause me to instantly um, throw it up again so it, w it, was, it was almost like a reflux action. So uh, there were times where I would, for example, sit up in bed, in, in hospital, sit up in bed to eat, finish eating, then move myself down to lie down. And that would, just that slight movement would cause me to throw up. So generally, I remember for about quite a few, quite a few weeks, actually, I just had to be fed in bed with, with trying not to move at all. 
I was also put on anti-sickness tablets, anti-sickness medications, so it would sort of cause the, uh, the sickness feeling to go away. Um, and I used to have that three times a day. Um, I pretty much had a permanent headache too, um, you know, head pains, or whatever, because of course the, 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 the impacts and everything of the, of the, of the, of the, of the brain hemorrhage. So I was on, you know, a lot of painkillers, a lot of medication, anti-sickness medication. Uh, my speech was slurred in the first couple of weeks, I'd say, um, and very quiet where I didn't have the energy and my speech was slightly slurred at some sentences, some words. Alhamdulillah, that went after a while, after a bit of uh, rehabilitation and everything. Was your memory okay? Memory, that's, that's the interesting one. So memory, um, Alhamdulillah, with, so Alhamdulillah, I'm a Hafiz. Uh, I finished Quran in 2012. So uh, mm-hmm. my mother was very, very wary about the fact that who knows if the hift is still there, if the Quran is still mm-hmm. there. And one thing I realized, I'm, my, my mother's also a Hafiza, uh, may Allah bless her. And she, I mean, wow. Uh, and she, in hospital, I remember, she used to spend pretty much most of the day with me. My father used to come and go. They would stay at a hotel on, on site. Uh, but of course, he had work and everything like that. So he used to work from home. But my mother, pretty much, she did volunteering. It was just so she used to be with me most of the time. She stopped then. And she was, uh, she used to, she used to spend hours with me just reading Quran, literally, just in the background. She's talking to me, but of course, at the same, you know, at, uh, what amazing we were, parents speaking the back, uh, Quran in the background. So it was, may Allah honor her, man. I uh, mean, inshallah, I mean, I mean. So alhamdulillah, I, I think that, and coupled with the fact that, um, alhamdulillah, my, I, it doesn't seem like my memory of any Quran went. Sorry to bother you, yeah. but just look at that, that. It's just so amazing. Yeah. To see the reliance upon Allah and the Quran Absolutely. at such a time, yeah. you know, at a time where, for example, often because emotions are so high, yeah. we can even forget about the thing that's important, which is Allah and that Absolutely. He's in control of all things. Absolutely, yeah. and Absolutely. Uh, and in that time, your mom doubling down on that yeah. and being like, "If we're going to get through something, it's going to be yeah. through Allah and His and His and His words." Mm-hmm. It's it, it's so amazing. That point alone is just yeah, yeah it so powerful. Definitely it reminds is. me of something a teacher once told me. He said that there was a, one of the pious predecessors who became, you know, one of the greatest scholars of their time, hmm. and he attributed it all to his parents. He said the righteousness oh. of the parents is the righteous, righteousness of the children, mm-hmm. and um, yeah, that's amazing to hear that. Yeah. Sorry, I'll let you continue, but that's yeah. just not me. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, no, that's 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 an, that's an amazing story. I think. That, that again, as 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 I previously mentioned, that uh, this whole episode caused me to sort of like my respect for my parents and my yeah, and how imagine. I see them change. That's just another thing, uh, and you know, like the the support the um, when I think back on the you know like my, the support for my mother, my mother pretty much you know it, I can imagine for for my mother as 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 a mother of a seventeen year old, it's not easy at all um, oh, to yeah. to see them. You have to feed them. You have to help them do anything at all. And it's, it must not be easy, you know, you've worked 17 years to try and get them to build up their confidence and build sure, up their sure. um, independence. And then it just goes back to square sure. one. Um, but I, th- I honestly think like through her support, through my father's support, and, his, and you know, he spent a lot of money on throughout my whole treatment. He, um, he spe- spent a lot of time with me. Uh, he did so many things for me. And I think this whole episode is just, it just, it just caused me to sort of, as I said, see them in a new light and my respect for them has just gone up by levels, alhamdulillah. So, uh, yeah. But in terms of memory, um, so the only thing actually which was affected and I've seen was affected. Uh, so my memory, alhamdulillah, has been completely intact. Uh, the only thing is I, alhamdulillah, so we lived in, um, in, in Dubai and then in Saudi for a few years during my childhood. And well, uh, during my teen years, my childhood and teen years. Uh, and alhamdulillah, I learned Arabic there. So I became fluent in it. And what I noticed is that um, that did it get effect- affected. It did. It did get affected. Okay. And I've uh, and since then I've spoken to certain um, individuals and everything, and they've said it's quite normal for episodes like that to cause you to forget your secondary uh, language or maybe other other. So Urdu, for example, I wasn't. I've never been fluent in it. Uh, so I'm half Bangladeshi, also half Pakistani. So my father's okay. originally Bangladeshi. So both languages I've been terrible at, anyways. Uh, but Arabic, I was fluent in, it and now uh, it's it, it got reduced quite a bit. But English, Lambda was completely unaffected as my mother tongue. So, mm-hmm. um, so yeah, that was that was from a memory point of view. Yeah. Wow. And um, h- how did it change your perception on things? Like now, looking back on it four years yep. later, because um, you're still so young, bro. You're 21. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I hope so. <laughs> yeah. No, you're very young. <laughs> so. Um, 
but I imagine there's so much wisdom there now because mm. of just the what, what what you went through at that point. Yeah. How did like perception of life, your Absolutely. relationship, your, your relationships in general? I know you touched on that a bit, mm. but your perception of life and and just your general psychology. How did it change? Uh, for, from what it was pre, the hemorrhage. Yeah. Uh, so I think I think before uh, before my illness, I. I think I used it. I I think all I can I can sort of I I can say on behalf of a lot of people around my age, we probably took a lot for uh, for for granted. Sure, a lot of things we used to take for granted. So I I mean, from my personal aspect, I used to take for granted the fact that I could I could I could just run and play football. Yeah. Um, now I can't do that. So that's something you I've still never can't been do that. Uh, yeah, I play cricket now. That's where I focus on. Sure. There's not too much running, uh, but football uh, and I also I mentioned fatigue. Yeah. So that sort of plays a part. So if I play football, you still football, get fatigue. Yeah. Do you, do you have to sleep minutes. quite a bit? Or? Um. I now it's a lot better. So like now you know I, I, it's roughly I can I can do six six hours you know per night. That's pretty much the requirement. That's the minimum requirement. Uh. But I remember before it used to have to be a lot more than that. So for example, actually I just mentioned a very short story. Um. My first. So after I came out of hospital, I was at home for two weeks and then. I was transferred to a rehabilitation center in the, in in Epsom. Okay. Uh, sorry. So yeah, so I went underwent rehabilitation there for um, a few months, and my first day there, actually, I remember um, it was an eight uh, sorry a nine a.m. start nine to four, with a two two hour break. So it was nine to uh, twelve. One to two is break. Oh, so you don't stay there. Four. No, no, I wouldn't okay. say that. I'd go there for the for the day. Uh, but I remember arriving there. Mm-hmm. I just slept pretty much, you know. At least probably I don't, I don't know how many hours the night before, but I, I arrived there. I underwent very very low, you know, it was very very minimal rehabilitation, sort of like physiotherapy, occupational therapy, you know, handwriting things like that. Um, it was and a little bit of walking and everything. But I remember that day I threw up I think seven times that day. Oh my gosh! Because of the motion and all of that, and I remember I went home. So uh, I finished at four. My father took me back. Uh, no, actually, sorry. Before I even left at four p.m. when we finished, I was so tired that I I fell asleep there at the at the center. They had given me a, sort of like a, a room where I could just rest and stuff like that for for the hours I was there, and I was so tired that I went and fell asleep there for about three hours. And when I woke up, my father took me home. Uh, my my mum my, my and dad took me home, and when we reached home, I remember praying Isha and completely collapsing. So just imagine, I mean, like, mm. I fell asleep at like, I think 7 p.m. So, well, 4 p.m. actually, you could say. Uh, woke up for Isha, uh, woke up, prayed at Maghrib, uh, I think, went home, Isha, went to bed around 8. And the next morning, uh, I think, uh, so Fajr, of course, then went back to sleep. And I woke up probably around 8 a.m. that morning and I was so tired still. So it just puts into perspective how much, um, mm. how much sleep you require. And today, for example, like I came down, I actually, last week, actually, uh, an example is with some of my friends from the ice stock for Palestine. We uh, we 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 climbed Mount Snowdon on Friday. Oh wow! So uh, it was just not not as in yesterday a week a week uh, a week ago. So we climbed Mount Snowdon. We I slept I think three hours the night before. We went to we went to Wales, climbed the whole mountain, came down, went back in the car, and that's when I took an hour's rest. So on three hours sleep, I was able to do all of that. Wow, and that's it was amazing. fine. So I think the when I look at the sort of like the disparity between between the two. It shows just how far Alhamdulillah have come, and you know, and things Alhamdulillah definitely look like they're going in 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 a better direction. Definitely. Well, so, h- how how did you um, take in the 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 qadr, right? Yeah. Like, um, how did you process, you know, why this was something mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. was written for you to go through? Yeah. And how did it impact your relationship with Allah? So uh, that thought. Didn't occur, alhamdulillah, it didn't occur to me too many times. So sometimes, uh, of course, you know, when, when uh, you know, I, I had just thrown up or I was like really unwell that day or something like that, it, it might have occurred to me a couple of times that, you know, why, why me as a 17 year old who has seemingly has their whole future ahead of them, why did it happen to me as such? But uh, one of the things I always stood back on is that, alhamdulillah, since my illness, I've developed. And people around me, around me have, said, have said this, and I think I feel it too. Where I try my best now to just focus any situation to po- focus on the positives. So um, it's uh, you know, uh, literally when I, I remember when lockdown first came in, 
I, uh, and and alhamdulillah, me, I, w- I, I've, I haven't tested positive and, you know, my family, my immediate family, my cousin in London actually, have, he, he tested positive. But otherwise, my immediate family, alhamdulillah, we're, we, we've all been fine. Did and you get the, you mentioned that you've already been double jabbed. Yeah. Is that because you of your, the hemorrhage? Uh, not, not necessarily. So my sister, uh, my older sister actually has a learning disability. Okay. So when I think the government back in February, they prioritized the people with learning disabilities. So when my sister received her invite, they said, you along with any other 80, over 18 members of your household. So me, my father, my, my mother, we, 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 got the, uh, we got the jazz because of in Feb. her. Uh, so we got our first one in just the beginning of March and our second one in end of May. Okay. Yeah. So Alhamdulillah. So, uh, so yeah. So, 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 she, uh, so uh, also, uh, well, to be fair, some, some other things that uh, I think the, the early flu jab they give. Yeah. Uh, I'm now eligible for that before I wasn't. Okay. I think it's just mainly just to protect and everything, protection yeah. and all that. So, uh, yeah, it has been a very different thing. But I think you're saying that you even uh, saw yeah. lockdown as a positive yeah, thing. Yeah. So, so I look at the positives on lockdown. So I saw lockdown came in. I was like, OK, the positives are it was, I was in my first year of university. So I thought, OK, positive. One positive is that all my exams are cancelled. <laughs> yeah, so that was the first one. Um, the second thing was like I saw, I thought, OK, we're, look, we're in England. We have we have the NHS here. We have probably the best healthcare system in the world or sure. one of the best in the world. I thought that, you know, that's, that's a positive. And you know, that alhamdulillah, they, they take care of people, elderly people in this country, um, they aren't left, you know, unfortunately in, in, in some other countries, um, people when they reach a certain age are just left to whatever, just, you know, rot, rot away. Unfortunately, that's, uh, apologies for the terminology, but you know, um, that's probably how it is. But at least here, even if they are in old people's homes or, you know, as my grandparents are in their own house and everything, at least they have some form of support. They have some form of looking after. And that's something that, you know, people wouldn't get. Mm. So I, th- I thought, you know, alhamdulillah, you know, the weather, alhamdulillah, wasn't bad. It was quite good, actually, during lockdown. So I thought, you know, rather than looking at the negatives, let's focus on the positives here. The so weather was good. It was. It was, it was really good. It really, was really good really last good. summer, wasn't yeah. it? Summer and even spring. Even spring. I yeah, think. yeah, yeah. And then Ramadan. this year it took a bit longer to get yeah. sunny. True, true, true. But now, alhamdulillah, it's not bad. So, yeah. yeah. It was, it was I really remember good. that. A really, really hot days. Really, yeah. Really, really warm, yeah. And th- those were the days where we couldn't even go for a walk. Yeah. You weren't even allowed out your house. Yeah, pretty much. Gosh, it feels so weird to imagine yeah. that, that was, it, there was a time in our lives mm. where we were not allowed to leave the house. Yeah, sure, and then they, were, then they made it a thing where one person from each house could go for like yeah. a little 10 minute walk or yeah. something. Half, half an hour mandate. Government, government wow. Mandate, I think, yeah. But then you look at, for example, t- um, people made the most of it. Captain Tom Moore. Yeah. Uh, then you have um, Dabirul uh, Dabirul Chowdhury in 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 Saint Albans. Oh, I've not heard of that there. one. So he, uh, Dabirul Chowdhury, he's a British Bengali guy. Um, oh, I think I have. He, he walked around laps on his of his garden. Yeah, yeah, I think I heard uh, about charity. that. For charity, so he did that while fasting in Ramadan. He's a hundred and hundred years old. Wow. Captain Tom Moore at ninety nine. He was he did uh, hundred laps of his garden, raised I think thirty three million for the NHS. I saw that. So yeah. Um. Uh, uh, yeah. So so so. To round off the discussion, because yeah. I think it's such an inspiring story to hear uh, and to see you now uh, and speaking about it. Mm. I think it's very motivating mm. to to mainly the, the motivation that I've gotten out of it is understanding that we are on this in this life mm. and there's going to be challenges yeah. and some of the challenges are going to be small and some are going to be Absolutely. very large, like what you went through. And um, and it's about as cliche as it sounds not how many times you get knocked down but how many yeah. times you get back up right absolutely and absolutely. um and and you seem to have made a success of getting up and, and i think that's amazing uh what would your having been through what you what you've been through what would your advice be to to other people who are going through tests now struggling to see the light at the end of the tunnel yeah um so people people have asked me this and i remember actually um at the begin, well towards the beginning of this year i sent uh i remember so at a, with our on our, on our ISOC committee, Islamic Society committee, um, we have a certain thing called Juma Gems, where one person is nominated each week to send a reminder uh, on Juma. And I remember when it was my turn, I sort of I, I sent a message about uh, two things. My reminder was mainly about two things. Number one, um, not taking things for granted and gratitude, showing gratitude for things you have, and not taking th- taking things for granted. And the other was uh, positivity, as I mentioned. I, I touched upon it earlier. In in my opinion, they are like when when someone is going through something. Of course, we're not belittling belittling whatever anyone's going through, but they are always always positives of that certain thing. No, no matter what anyone is going through, 
um, I think it, I remember my father was actually mentioning this hadith to me um, during my recovery, the first time I actually spoke, and I remember this. And he mentioned this hadith and it sort of stuck in my mind ever since. And he, and he mentioned it before, but it, since then, I can remember re- really, really, really well. And it's uh, the, the, the Prophet said that, um, that uh, amazing is the state of a believer. Ajaban li amr al-mu'min. That amazing is the state of a believer. Uh, whatever afflicts him or her is good for them, right? If, for example, uh, if, if something good happens to him or her, they show gratitude. So it is good for them. And if something bad see, or seemingly bad occurs to them, they show patience, so it's good for them. So it's a win-win situation, sure, essentially. Yeah. So if it's good, gratitude. If it's bad, patience. And they both lead to uh, pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that sort of resonates with me. That even if I'm, it, when I was going through that recovery process, right, that was something that lingered in the back. That this is all, inshallah, worth it in the end, right? And, and, and hopefully, and of course, we, all, we also know that every single test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a, a, a means of, expi- of, of, of uh, wiping out and expi- of course, expi- yeah. deeds. So that was something else. I thought, okay, I, I'm sure all of us, all of us are, are sinners, of course, but I was thinking, okay, I've done X, Y, and Z. Sure. Inshallah, that is getting wiped out yeah, with all of this most suffering raising, going through. Right? So if you think that, when, 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 when a person thinks that way, I think that definitely helps to... Um, motivate and sort of think that okay there is some hope at the end sure sure um and the other thing is positivity um which i touched on earlier is that in every single situation there is there are positives there are positives like for example my illness a simple thing is that um so my just before we moved back i had moved i've moved back to england so i was born born in england um i lived here for the first roughly six years of my life then i was in dubai uh and then i was in saudi in jeddah uh, I had moved back to the UK in July, so a month, just over a month before this. Okay. And when I think on back on it now, and my mother says the same thing that I don't know if you've heard, but Saudi Arabia, the healthcare system is is pretty poor. Um, you know, there's no proper ambulance system. They don't really have an address system. Uh, there's no NHS, of course. So it's you have to pay extortion amounts for um, healthcare there. And when I think back on it now, I think okay. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala delayed my illness by one month. I was in Saudi for eight years. But so any of those eight years, this illness could have happened. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala delayed it to one month after I moved back to England. So I could get the NHS treatment. And with the hospital I was treated at, the uh, St. George's is, one, is recognized as the regional um, neurosurgical s- uh, center or neurosurgical hospital in Europe. One of the top in Europe. So I'm thinking, okay, I was given all of that. So rather than focusing on the illness itself, thinking, okay, this was all, this all happened afterwards where I was, you know, it was, it was absolutely fine. All of that, I had all, all the treatment, the best treatment, the best doctors, best hospitals, best care. And at the same time, the whole treatment, the whole process, um, I didn't need, or my family didn't need to pay, it, well, next to nothing. They had to pay next to nothing because of the NHS treatment. Wow. So it's true. It's truly, you know, simply, I think the, in every situation, there are always positives. Every situation. Yeah, I've heard it being said before that, you know, that um, famous ayah that says, uh, uh, verily with hardship there is ease. Yeah. Um, I've heard it be said that, you know, some of the, uh, some of the tafsir mentions that, you know, uh, when hardship comes, there'll yeah. be some kind of ease, right? Yeah, but, um, but there's a tafsir that mentions that it's before the hardship there is ease okay um and like i said I, I heard this said in a lecture and and what they said this is years ago i heard this but they said that often you'll find that someone will like have something great going on in their life and then something rough happens right like Absolutely. a common one they said was um you may uh get married and then a parent passes away mm. and then you go like oh, i just got married why did yeah. my parent have to pass mm-hmm. away now but imagine just changing that perception and saying, it was always written for my parents to pass away, but look at the blessing I got in being able to get married first so that Absolutely. I have someone to lean on and Absolutely. someone to deal with emotionally. It sounds like that's the perception you're taking, which is amazing. Yeah. Um, so you're, you're now in university, you're studying business and management. Yes. What's the, what's the ultimate goal now then? Uh, so inshallah, I mean, uh, hopefully, when, um, hopefully I, I mean, I'm just about to start my final year, inshallah. Um, this next year is my final year. And 
inshallah hopefully i'd like to st- go straight into uh, into work i've sort of narrowed down my options to um hr or marketing okay those are the two which i seem to have a keen interest in mm-hmm. um uh, but yeah uh, as of such i haven't sort of um sort of finalized or decided anything yet but um inshallah i would like to go 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 into that um and hopefully in a few years probably i might um after a bit of experience and everything uh i might be keen to undertake a, a mba oh wow that'd be nice master business administration yeah, yeah. so that's uh something f- for my for my for my course for my um career career path you could say yeah of course very uh, well it, very like renowned yeah to it, an it, MBA. Is, it is yeah it is so inshallah that's that's the plan well listen abdullah thank you so much for jumping on fresh regarding it no no problem at all and and i'm I'm just sorry it's such a short episode obviously considering we were, we were filming this on a weekend for yeah. those who are listening to it um sometime after um it, i always feel so blessed that i can sit in front of amazing people like yourself who've been through um like experiences that many people haven't been through and be able to relearn yeah lessons from them and take from them Absolutely. and um today's one of those days so thank you so much for sharing with me and also with no the problem. audience sure. and i know i imagine that it's not easy to 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 constantly think back on and yeah. perhaps you get asked about it a lot and stuff as well so um, i appreciate that and the overwhelming uh point that i've taken from it is look at things with positivity Absolutely. Absolutely. and uh, if that's all if you can inspire one person through this sure, podcast yeah. to look at their situation sure. with positivity i think um that'll be an amazing thing Inshallah. Inshallah. so uh, thank you so much abdullah and uh, and um, thank you to everybody who listened this was episode 235 Inshallah. i believe of freshly grounded i will see you again next week uh, do leave your comments for abdullah in the comment section assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh